Dara, it is almost a year ago to the day that you said, and I'll never forget this, that it felt scarier than 9-11. Now that you have lived through this last year, how do you reflect on that feeling today? Well, I think the feeling uh, reflected the reality that we've seen. Uh, this is an event that has affected everyone around the world. I think no one has escaped uh, the tragedy that, that this pandemic has represented. And the effects have been obviously long lasting. It's been over a year. Uh, we now see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we are by no means there. And, and I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, to get there. And, uh, and just like September 11th, uh, change the face of travel and how people traveled, et cetera, uh, I think that the pandemic is going to really change the way that we live and we work. Uh, and I think some of those changes remain to be seen. Uber has also transformed dramatically in the last year. You're, you've doubled down on food delivery. You've made some acquisitions. You're getting in on grocery. You've also sold um, equity stakes in the self-driving unit, flying cars, electric bikes. How much different is the Uber that you're running today um, than the Uber that you thought you were going to run when you came from Expedia? Well, I think it, uh, it, it's very different, first of all, in that when I came from Expedia, really Uber was about mobility. I, I, all the questions I asked, all the research that I did was about the mainline rides business or mobility business. And Uber Eats was this like, kind of cool thing uh, that Jason Drogi and a couple of other folks had had built, but it was, you know, it was it was a growth uh, vector. But I would have never ever anticipated that the delivery business uh, would get to the 50 billion run rate that we're talking about now, uh, just three and a half years later. Uh, and I think, you know, that's as big as the Uber rides business was. So we've essentially built another Uber, um, partially because of the great work of the teams who built that business, but also benefiting from the pandemic and the onrush of commerce to the home. Uh, we've been one of the beneficiaries, and I think we've, we've executed really well behind that. So uh, I think the result of all this is a bigger Uber, uh, a more diversified Uber, uh, and really an Uber that's about going to places and getting anything within your home, becoming a bigger and bigger part of, of your life. It has caused us to, uh, to sell or merge some of the biz, uh, pieces of the business uh, that we consider non-core, partially because the delivery opportunity is so big and we wanted to double down on it and really focus on making sure that we deliver on the promise there. And we still got a long way to go. Well, and you still have equity stakes in Aurora, in Lime, in Joby, in this $13 billion investment portfolio. And I wonder what the strategy is there. Is Uber a VC now? <laughs> We're, you know, uh, I'd say by no means a VC. Listen, on the, the investment portfolio is, is significant. Uh, and we think the value of that investment portfolio is going to grow. Uh, we also have a very large stake in Didi, uh, who's a big rideshare player in China, Grab, a uh, joint venture that we have with Yandex as well. They're all about mobility and delivery uh, ecosystem. Uh, so any investor who invests in Uber gets a benefit of the mainline business and networks that we're running this delivery and mobility network on a global basis and also gets further growth from the ecosystem that we have developed through some of these partnerships. Uh, either way, it's gonna be a win-win. So as the world starts to open up, what is the picture of demand you're seeing? You know, we've heard speculation about a roaring 20s style return. Is that uh, how you would characterize it? And how are you preparing to ramp to meet that demand to make sure there are enough couriers and drivers to serve all your customers? Well, while sometimes it might feel like it, I wasn't around in the roaring 20s to uh, exactly give that <laughs> characterization. After, after this year, I feel like maybe I was. Uh, but, but we're definitely seeing trends that are encouraging. Um, our bookings, February over January, month-on-month uh, -month increased 15% on a month-on-month -month basis. March is stronger than February as well as we, things open, uh, as we see things open up. Uh, and we think there's more to go, right? The, the minority of the population has been vaccinated. Things have not completely opened up, but in certain markets like in Miami, 
uh, our mobility business is down only 25%. So it's getting back to close to normal. And remember, we have very little airport activity and our delivery business is growing over 100%. So we might see for Uber a period in which we're hitting on all cylinders, uh, which, which would be a pretty significant positive going forward. Now, you just announced a dramatic change in the UK, reclassifying 70,000 drivers as workers, not full-time employees, but they are entitled to more benefits, like vacation pay, for example. What kind of conversations are you having about doing this in other countries? What will Uber be doing voluntarily to improve conditions for drivers in other places when it's not a matter of the law, like in the UK well, or in California? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the worker designation is a designation that, that's unique to the UK, right? It's, it's not a full-time worker. Um, it comes with flexibility, but it also includes uh, benefits that you talked about as well. And we have argued um, quite proactively now that uh, we believe that the nature of gig work should change, not to take away the flexibility that all of drivers, couriers, et cetera, prize the most, but to include some benefits, uh, whether it's healthcare benefits, vacation pay, et cetera. Uh, we call it our IC plus. Uh, we believe that's the right thing for societies to go forward with. Uh, and as a result, that theme fit very much into the UK worker model. And we decided we're going to step forward and we're going to do the right thing. Hopefully our doing the right thing in the UK will lead to others in the industry uh, also following suit. Um, these are discussions that we are having uh, in other countries. Obviously, regulation here is very local. Uh, India, for example, recently passed a regulation that looks similar, but we think this model of maximum flexibility to earn the way that you want to, along with some benefits, we think that is the future model, and it's one that we're going to support. Now, you've said this will increase costs, but won't impact profitability. And I've been talking to analysts today, and one of them said, the math doesn't work out. At least my math doesn't work out. So do the math for us, your math. Who's footing the bill for this? Is it going to be passed on to the customer? Well, I, I, I would say that um, maybe the analysts should check their math. Uh, we, we wouldn't say that we're on track for profitability unless we thought we were on track for profitability and unless we intend to get there. Uh, the fact is that the mobility business uh, at uh, maturity, and for example, January, February of last year, our mobility business had segment EBITDA of 20 plus percent. Uh, so these are costs that we can bear. Uh, it's an additional investment that we are making in our uh, in drivers. And we think it's a worthwhile investment that we will be able to make to build the long-term path forward and hit profitability at the same time. Uh, it comes with some risk, but uh, we're paid to take risk and we're paid to make things work out. And that's our intention as far as profitability goes. Meantime, Dara, inevitably, when I do an interview with you or the CEO of DoorDash, I'm, you know, I get tweets from drivers who say they're still not paid enough. And the critics say that the gig economy model may be increasing inequality. How do you respond to that? You know, I think that... Um, Listen, the the pay that drivers or couriers make, uh, you can debate whether it's enough or not. But the facts are, for example, that in the UK, um, our drivers already earn, at, in London, for example, already earn approximately 17 pounds per hour. That's close to, that's about 24 bucks an hour. Uh, and that kind of pay uh, is significantly above minimum out there. Uh, and we think um, you can earn that kind of money and have absolute ability to work when you want, how you want, where you want. We think it's a compelling value proposition. Uh, so, you know, 17, 17 pounds an hour is a decent number. Uh, and with flexibility, it gets to be a pretty compelling way to earn. Now, you've said that Uber won't be investing in Bitcoin but it's continued to see an incredible rise and more corporate acceptance. Are you sticking with that? And any, any more discussions behind the scenes about uh, plans to accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment? 
Uh, well, well, I actually talked about, you know, we would look to accept uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency uh, if the demand is there, if the economics are right. Uh, as far as investing in Bitcoin, it's not something that I see near term. You know, maybe it'll change in a couple of years. But remember, we're not profitable yet. Uh, the risk of the company is still a company that is pre-profitable. So usually your investment activity as far as a treasury shouldn't be about speculation or shouldn't be about, you know, we're not going to make a bunch of money because of our treasurer. We're going to make a bunch of money because our operators get there and our treasury is going to keep us safe uh, as we journey on to profitability. Meantime, Dara, as we've been speaking, Brazil just reported 90,000, more than 90,000 new cases of COVID-19. You obviously have a huge business there. In your view, is, is the crisis uh, nearly over or is it still far from over? I, I think that the, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, as I said, but the crisis isn't over. There's a lot of wood to shop between now and then. Uh, we've got to stay vigilant uh, in terms of masking up in terms of keeping our distance. And the challenge of vaccinating billions of uh, people all around the world, it's a shared challenge that we all have to contribute to. And, and for example, we are doing our part in terms of providing free rides and the partnership that we have with Walgreens, uh, helping drivers who are designated as frontline uh, workers uh, get a special code that they can they can use to get vaccinated at Walgreen. There's a lot of work ahead of us. And I think the road back is absolutely happening, and, but it's going to be bumpy. Uh, and I think we all have to work together to get there as quickly as possible.